when I had my accident, I went out to Long Island where I have uh, my uh, godmother and cousins. And I was visiting them, and then there was a door in between. I had gone into the other room to do something with my mom. And I could hear through the door, and they say, yeah, but he's still the same. You know? And that's true. You don't change. If you're a rat, you're going to be a rat. If you, you know, a decent person, you're going to be a decent person. That you learn, you know, in the hospital with people. A son of a bitch is a son of a bitch. Just because you have an accident doesn't change. You, you, you are what you are. Now, me and Mark get mad because physically challenged. We ain't physically challenged. We're fucked up. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're physically challenged, sure. Ain't no challenge. Lenny Contino became my friend in 1960 because I arrived in the same hospital room where he lived as a quadriplegic, and I arrived as a paraplegic. And sure enough, I meet Mark in the hospital, and the elevator opens up, and there's this crazy guy I see in a red wheelchair, and short pants, skinny little legs, a corset on for his back, and a beard. And the door closes, and I say to my mom, I says, there's some crazy looking people here. Like I say, I had never seen a guy with a beard at that point. Only rabbi, so it was interesting. And that's where it all started. There's Mark, this guy. And, and then he started drawing. He drew a portrait of me, and I drew one in Revenge, which I still think he has. I, uh, I think I burned the eyes out of it with my cigarette, <laughs> and I signed Castro. And then from that, I started to draw. I mean, everybody liked our room. It was a nutty room. We had a great time there. You know, the nurse came in one day, kissed me happy birthday, and, you know, I had a spasm and fell out of the bed. It was, like, chaotic, but it was good. It, you know, I came back to life. There were people that would look at Lenny and would say, poor Lenny, which, of course, is the great difficulty for anybody with a handicap. They think, oh, well, poor Mark or poor Lenny, you know, I, uh, it's okay because it's done by somebody handicapped. His control was at a level that is way beyond uh, what I do. And after that, Mark went, you know, with his way, I went mine, to Roosevelt Island. And that was Welfare Island at the time, place of last resort. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from that, I guess we were we became friends. And Mark came to see me on Roosevelt Island, where I was. and. He started an art class there, you know, basically wanted me to do art. And to this day, he hasn't forgiven me because he got this class going with all the patients, work, but I would never go. But he got me into it by giving me paint, brushes, canvas, you know, and, and just taking me around and explaining about art, what I could see. I knew nothing about it, even though I was good in just school, but otherwise I didn't know. It was a great experience. He taught you, like I say, without teaching, you know, which is a good way to do it. He made me want to do it. It, so, it looks so much, you know, so good, so, like fun. And it is. That's what I, I think about. I mean, I got excited one time over a catalog of brushes like it was penthouse. And then I knew I liked art. And I'm not joking when I say that. I did. There was a sense that he did with his life that he was accomplishing something that was unique. If you look at the paintings, just the paintings, the exactness of uh, the geometry that he chose, there is that sense of impossibility. Uh, people can't believe it could be done by somebody who is a quadriplegic. A quadriplegic means that you have no strength in your arms, you have no strength in your hands, but it doesn't mean that you can't think, that you can't see. And he was able to show that with dedication, the impossible can be done. And he proved that a person with will can do art no matter what. And I just do them. I don't think about them. You waste your time if you think. You wind up doing nothing. So I just start. You know, I erase. And I learn more sometimes from my erasures than I learn from what I'm actually doing. 
It just that works that way. You know, just do it. Don't think about it. There was a thing that grew in him of dedication, of uh, a willingness, and that, of course, was the real cure. He lived a life that was very poor. I saw this struggle, and I tried to get him to show uh, with us, which he did, so that he was considered by my my peers as a regular artist. I think that really the way I helped Lenny the most was that I talked with him. And I guess after that, I used to go to the studio on Sundays, my mom and I. She'd bring cookies, take his laundry back, and it was great. We'd have a great time. You know, artists would come over and they'd talk. He built an elevator. So, we, you know, he'd pull, and I'd go up floor to floor, and my mother would run in between close the door in case it gave way. I wouldn't fall so far. Usually a lot of, uh, you'd wind up at somebody's studio too. Something was going on from there, you go there. It was constantly, you know, one place to another. I'd get home six or seven in the morning sometimes. And it was great times to talk about art. You know, there were all these galleries, like everybody was just opening up, putting together commune. You know, I even got to be in the first show at Park Place, you know, which is really quite an honor in a way. It was his search that turned out those paintings that now deserve that kind of recognition that uh, truly dedicated artists who work at it constantly end up doing something that opens doors for other people, that gives that sense of energy to other people so that there is the capacity for Yes, beauty, but also that excitement of life. And Mark taught a lot to me a lot about that. You don't have to be a lot of expensive stuff, this, that, you can do it. Make art almost out of nothing. He could do that. Yeah, we would go, like I say, to the Whitney, all the museums, and he would explain to me, you know, what was going on, the color, the, you know, space, how they used it, perspective, and all these different, you know, things. And I, I learned. I mean, I didn't even know enough to prime a canvas when I first started. I mean, paint would start coming off. I had to, you know. Yeah, we collaborated on a few pieces. You know, I I draw it, he cut it. What should I do? Twist it this way? I say, yeah, that way. Then he would do it, and it was good. Some good pieces we did. I think that Lenny totally believed that his paintings were spiritual, that they were a way of expressing this complete belief that he had in, uh, in religion, in uh, that kind of life. You know, it's a struggle, but it's a struggle we love. You know, it's, I always consider it like a calling to the priesthood. You know, you really got to be totally dedicated to it, you know, and that's the way it is. You think it, you live it, you eat it. It's like that. And he produced great, beautiful work. And of course it influenced my work, you know, like it's uh, all a give and take, this strange conversation which is called art. I mean, I remember this girl I had, woman, and she said to me, she started crying. I said, what are you crying about? She says, you love your art more than me. I says, yeah, it's true. I love my mother first, my art second, and you third. <laughs> she, it was like, she, I hope they don't forget about it. But it was true, I ain't going to lie. I could, live with, uh, I, I could live without her, but I couldn't live without the art. You know, it's just that... And your mother goes without saying, you know? Yeah. Anella never painted one stroke on the paintings. But without her setting him up, a constant sense of belief in the worth of his work, it made the work become real 
and his dedication came off of hers. They reached a pitch of uh, understanding between each other. She had to do everything for him. This is not a thing of 10 years or 20 years or something like that. His neck was broken when he was a less than 18. Uh, so that she became a partner in this uh, work, this vision, this mission that became his life because he dedicated his life towards an art that was extremely pure, extremely geometric, and yet would not be cold. Love is such a wonderful thing. Powerful, capable, because they were a team. That's what built it. That's what built the paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, I don't, I don't know if I could imagine if I had never had my accident, what would my life be? It sure wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have met the people I met. It wouldn't have been as interesting. I would have probably been driving an eight-wheeler somewhere. Or if I hadn't been already, gotten killed in Vietnam. So, you know. I think that there is always in Lenny's work this positivism. Through the work, you never feel the anguish that his life was. He lived a total life of hell, physical, and uh, frustration. And he, like very rare artists, overcame it all. I could uh, phone Lenny at any time of the day or night and tell him what was going wrong with my uh, love life, what was going wrong with my guts. We were brothers together. He gave me strength to handle things that generally are considered uh, not impossible, but are generally considered the torture that artists go through, the doubt that the work is going to be accepted. You know, it's like our pets were meant to be. And I never would have been doing art without Mark. Literally, I'd be dead a long time ago. I think Mark would be dead too without the art. We, we bonded in, in the hospital. Uh, it was as if as he became a brother. And for a brother, <laughs> For a brother, you do everything you can. I understand him and he understands me. Nobody except us can understand mm -hmm. what it's like, what it takes, what it involves. You know, and it's like you say, we're brothers. You know, more than blood. His paintings are an ideogram, a uh, uh, oh total positive affirmation of what human beings can do.